Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another evening session of our Lenten journey towards becoming beloved community. I'm Patty Ames, the Canon for Christian Formation and the Diocesan Staff Liaison for our mission and ministry of becoming beloved community. Tonight, we will focus on education, resources, um, and how to walk with others on their journey towards becoming beloved community. Tonight, I'm joined by several guiding team members, Virginia Sweet, Brian Hutchison, Sally Mueller, and Boyd Evans. We will talk about a variety of different educational resources, tools that you can use, and programs that might be effective. But before we begin this evening's program, let us center ourselves in prayer. I invite you to settle your hearts and your minds, take a deep breath, and let us pray. Creator, we give you thanks for all you are and all you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel in the center of this sacred circle through which all creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit. For you are God, now and forever. Amen. Again, that prayer comes, it's the gathering prayer from the Disciples Prayer Book from the Episcopal Church Office of Indigenous Ministries. St. Paul's Bear Mountain, one of our parishes in Amherst, uses that prayer every week in their worship. And so that begins the resources that we have to share with you this evening that you may not be familiar with, some you are, and some will hope that you will share as well. It's important to focus and begin with prayer, and that's part of our work in becoming beloved community. These are some resources, and I want to let you know that we will provide this slide deck so that you don't have to jot everything down, um, and you will receive that in an email tomorrow along with other resources. Tonight's session, as all, are being recorded. They'll be posted tomorrow on our social media and available on our Dio Suava YouTube channel. These are some resources, as I mentioned, the Disciples Prayer Book from the Office of Indigenous Ministries with the Episcopal Church. There are Becoming Beloved Community Prayers and Liturgical Resources from the Episcopal Church as well, and of course, the Book of Common Prayer. As we begin to talk about resources and things you might use for yourself and for your parish, for a group, it's also important to remember that these programs and, and different resources can be used with a variety of ages and people in different stages of their faith and their journey towards becoming beloved community. It's also important to remember that there's not just one class or one book that's going to change us. It's an ongoing mission and ministry towards becoming beloved community. As we live out our baptismal covenant every day, so too are we called to becoming beloved community and working on that every day. It's also important to remember for people, especially if you're developing resources for a parish to use, that it's not just one book or, or program or class that would work for all people. We're in different places on our faith journey, and we must provide people a variety of what I call on-ramps to find the way that's comfortable for them in their work of becoming beloved community. One of those programs that we use quite a bit that started through the Episcopal Church, but now has expanded past that and very inclusive is Sacred Ground. And some of our guiding team members are here to talk with you about Sacred Ground. It's 
Sally or? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Patty. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Sally Muller. Um, and I would like to speak a little bit with you about Sacred Ground. This program was created by Katrina Brown, who directed and produced Traces of the Trade after she discovered that her family from Rhode Island was the largest slave trading company in the colonies at the time. Um, and she was distraught by that and determined that she would like to do something to help right the wrong. So she developed the program along with help um, from, uh, let's see, Ken and Stephanie Spellers, is that correct, Patty? I believe, yes. okay. And um, she, this, this program is part of Bishop Curry's Becoming Beloved Community. And he is very supportive of the program, which you will see through a video that we're going to show you here shortly. The program is basically a walk back through history to learn our past treatment of different marginalized groups. Um, Native Americans, uh, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, and it's all very much hard truths. It's not the history that we learned in school. It is, um, it is much more detailed and explicit. Through this program, which is both, um, it's online primarily through videos and articles, there are also two books that we use, um, but through this program, it is a faith-based dialogue to discern our history, the consequent legacies that it has left us, and how we can move forward to improve our, um, our treatment of marginalized individuals. It is an 11 session program that can be done either of, in 11 weeks, meeting once a week, or it can be done every other week. There, there are various ways to do it. It can be done through Zoom meetings such as this one, or it can be done in person, whatever your leader and the people involved in the group would like. Um, I'm currently leading two groups one is a Zoom group and one is an in-person group. And the individuals involved have, have all been very surprised by what we didn't know, what we didn't learn in school. Um, so it's not always easy. As I said, there are some hard truths, but we use the past history to help us move forward. So I hope that many of you will look into the program and give it serious consideration. It, it truly can be life-changing and in the end uplifting because it, it gives you some goals and some ways to move forward. Thank you, Patty. Sure, thank you, Sally. I appreciate the information and background. Um, by just seeing who's on the call, I know that some of you have already taken sacred ground, but one of the things that people had asked me was, how can I share this with others? I can tell them my experience. And uh, I put together uh, a video that anyone can use. Um, just contact me, but it's people from around our diocese, lay and clergy, that answer several questions about why they took sacred ground and, and what they got out of it. And so now I invite you to watch this video that we produced um, that is available to help promote sacred ground throughout our diocese. Sacred Ground is a video dialogue series on race and faith. Through the stories of our culture, the stories of our sojourn here in America, the stories of race, both the joys and the sorrows, by listening to those stories and hearing them, 
and then telling our own stories together and then looking possibly at the stories of our very faith somehow from the travail and the reality of all of those stories may emerge hope for a new day i'm reminded that in the third chapter of exodus in the hebrew scriptures moses climbed up mount sinai he was trying to discern whether he should go back to Egypt to help to free the Hebrew slaves. He climbed up on the mountain and saw a burning bush. And in the vision of this burning bush, he heard the voice speak to him, Moses, Moses, take off the shoes from your feet for the ground on which you are standing is holy ground, sacred ground. And then the voice from the bush said, I am the God of your ancestors, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A friend of mine many years ago preached on that text. And he said the reason that Moses was summoned to take off the shoes from his feet, because the ground on which he was standing was holy ground. Not because the dirt was holy, but because God was about to tell his story. Whenever someone tells their story, you are standing on holy ground. Sacred ground is a time, an opportunity to hear the story of our past with regard to race, to hear our stories of our past, and then to write a new story for a new future where there's plenty good room for all of God's children. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. Sacred Ground provides a safe space to ask questions about race, ethnicity. You truly begin to understand aspects of white privilege and ways you can turn privilege into advocacy for others. It's kind of like the offering plate at church. If we all contribute to eliminating social isms and otherings, we collectively contribute to the betterment of society. Do it, take it, don't hesitate. Go all in, learn, be proactive, be open and honest when you take it, really do some deep soul searching when you take it and um, and keep digging because it's all extremely important information that many of us never knew or never knew about. Um, so I would highly encourage anyone that has even the littlest glimmer of interest to take it. The best part of Sacred Ground for me was hearing other people's stories and hearing other people's reflections on how they've been changed by the experience. Um, it helped me to see the ways that I still needed to change and grow. Um, it's not something that I can accomplish alone in a room with a bunch of books, no matter how hard I would like to try at that. Um, it requires community. Um, it requires other people. It requires reflecting back to each other what we're seeing and hearing. Um, and being able to do that either in a room with other people or on Zoom with other people made a really big difference for me. I think perhaps the biggest part was just how pervasive and enduring racism is in our country. And what I didn't realize as um, it really is a part of the fabric and the beginning of, of who we are and it's so pervasive and so innervated in so many systems that it's almost invisible. Sacred ground is important for, uh, for everyone to participate in because we are all participating in a society that is intrinsically racist on some levels. And so if we're going to accomplish any type of healing or allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, move us to true wholeness, we have to be able to acknowledge our past, understand where we are today, so that we can envision the future that God has for us. 
and I got more out of sacred ground and the information that I gathered than any sociology course I've taken. Um, these are hard truths to learn about. It's difficult information, but it really arms you with the appropriate level of knowledge to do something for a community. My biggest takeaway from sacred ground was that we all need a safe space to learn about racial dynamics and um, and racist attitudes and we don't always understand even what the meaning of that is and by having a safe space to learn and understand it better it gives everyone a place to speak freely and share thoughts on it. There's nothing to lose and everything to gain. Come with an open heart, come with an open mind, uh, come willing to change and to be changed. Uh, so many folks who have refused to take it or has not, have not wanted to take it, uh, they have that fear or that worry that they're gonna be judged somehow. Uh, maybe they had thoughts in the past or, or experiences in the past, or maybe they feel like their ancestors are being judged somehow. Uh, that's not what sacred ground is about at all. We acknowledge the past, but it's only so that we can uh, realize where we are today uh, in the hopes of moving towards the, the kingdom on, of God on earth as it is in heaven, as our Lord Jesus teaches us to pray. So again, if you are interested in being part of a Sacred Ground group, I invite you to reach out to me or one of the guiding team members that is near you in, in your city or convocation, and we are all more than willing to help you find others that are wanting to be part of a Sacred Ground circle and to start a new class. We're going to take a look now at a different, whoop, hang on as soon as I can get this to go. There we go. A different class some others across the diocese have taken, um, which is called allyship training. This is not a faith-based program, but a very helpful program um, in our work of becoming beloved community. And I'm gonna turn it over to Virginia and Brian to talk a little bit about allyship. Hello, this is Brian and um... I just wanted to talk for a little bit about uh, this wonderful organization called Service Never Sleeps. Um, a young lady named Whitney Parnell is the, um, the owner of that, and they're based out of Washington, D.C., and she's a wonderful teacher. So if you're looking to go maybe past sacred ground and uh, do a little something deeper, uh, these allyship classes are wonderful. Um, and uh, as it says there on the slide, allyship, the status or role of a person who advocates and actively works for the inclusion of a marginalized or politicized group in all areas of society, not as a member of that group, but in solidarity with its struggle and point of view and under its leadership. And so Whitney teaches us in these allyship classes um, how to be an ally um, to the marginalized groups, um, wh whatever group that that might be. Um, so again, these are wonderful classes. They're not free. Um, they are several hundred dollars. Um, uh, but if you have some money in your budget, uh, your parish budget maybe has some money for under mission or education, this would be a very good class. Like I've said, if you've already taken Sacred Ground, Allyship is a, is a wonderful program, a wonderful class. Many around the diocese have already taken it. Many lay people and clergy um, have already taken this class, and it's, it's very good. Um, and I will um, turn it over to Virginia Sweet to talk a little bit about her experience. Thanks, Brian. I'm Virginia Sweet. I'm a member of Christ Episcopal Church in Roanoke. I took uh, Sacred Ground when it was only 10 sessions. And I must say, it was such a transformative class. I just, I cannot express how transformed I was. It took me 70 years before I was able to learn accurate history. And I tell you, I've never been the same since. But it did leave me hanging a little bit, particularly because for the first 20 years of my career, I was a social worker. And social workers had the resources and the clients needed them. 
and the social workers had access to those resources that the clients needed, it automatically put me in what I considered a superior position. And that's how I had been raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was superior. Anyway, I didn't even know about white privilege or anything until I started taking all of these courses. And then, fortunately, after Sacred Ground, the diocese was sponsoring the allyship with Whitney Parnell. And I mean, that told me what I needed to do because I was at a loss. Okay, I can't be superior. I have to give that up. I can't, you know, all that stuff has to fall away. Then what, what do I do? What do I do? And Whitney taught us that white people have to move other white people along the continuum to be more open, to be more accepting, to shed their racism, to understand systemic racism, and that we need to be allies in the Black community's effort for whatever they want to accomplish, you know, whether it be um, better housing, better roads, better schools, whatever, let the Blacks lead us and we stand beside and we are the allies. So this wonderful opportunity came along. Um, I was taking several of us from Christ Episcopal had joined St. John's Episcopal in Roanoke and Williams Memorial Baptist Church, which is a stellar Black church. Um, and the, we had we had started taking another uh, racial uh, class, and it really did point out. I mean, it was so self-evident about the systemic racism. And toward the end of that four or five week series, uh, the Reverend Dr. Jones uh, from Williams Memorial told us about this Evan Springs across from Valley View Mall that was a, that was the city was talking about developing it again. And they had talked about it in 2011 and 2019, they came close to now that we're bringing it up again. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, we could be white allies for this black community who were against that. Well, it's been two years. Yesterday was the, the final reading of uh, the vote to accept the plan. And um, we, we had three votes and the developer to develop it commercially had four votes, but we had compiled so much research and we'd stood behind our black leaders and they spoke and that, and we did what white privilege can do, open some doors and whatever else that's a healthy thing to do. And I want you to know that that was a victory because we have a seat at the table we were able to get one of the council people to amend the whole thing so that we now have 70 acres out of 150 will be green um, and preserved. And it's and now with a seat at the table, we will be able to um, even bite off more of that apple. And so it really was a victory and it worked so beautifully. There was so much learning for developing relationships across those cultural lines. And the our leader who's black, his, his uh, level of timing or his sense of timing is a whole lot different than us white people in the group. We were going, when, why, 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 hurry up, got to do this, we got to plan ahead. Just laid back. But anyway, it all worked out and we learned much more about what happens when um, black leadership who had the most to lose and the most to invest can work and approach a city council and get that much movement in them. It's been a glorious experience. So um, I highly recommend that you put your learning into action and then it becomes really integrated into you, your brain and your heart. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I think you highlighted some important points there um, that it's it's not just us. We can work ecumenically to with other groups to be allies and allyship can cross many lines. Um, we certainly need to be allies and support our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, um, anywhere that we can as these steps show on the slide, listen to others so that we can help 
and be helpful in appropriate ways, show up and speak up is so important. A couple of you all had talked uh, about after sacred ground and as um, Virginia said, kind of, or Brian leaving you hanging um, and allyship was one of those things. I also want to just highlight here next week, the Reverend Marisa Safantes will be with us to talk exactly about that um, after, and it doesn't matter if you've taken sacred ground, but what next, what steps can you take to listen show up and speak up. We're going to continue with some other resources. Um, last week, uh, I believe it was Tuck mentioned the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing, um, which is located in Atlanta. And we have had several people from our diocese go there. It's my hope that I continue to put funding in our diocesan budget for Becoming Beloved Community, that other groups could go to the center. Um, Dr. Catherine Meeks, pictured here, is the founder, leader of that, along with the Diocese of Atlanta. Um, this is one of her books that she's holding, The Night is Long, But the Light Comes in the Morning. And she is a wonderful speaker. If you ever have an opportunity to hear her or go back on YouTube and listen to some of her talks um, she is wise and truly prophetic, I believe, in helping us all move forward to becoming beloved community. There are other church resources or other resources for our becoming beloved community work that the Episcopal Church has for us. Um, they're listed out here. Again, this will all be in the email sent out tomorrow. Um, but there are great resources. The one I would like to highlight here as they're all important, um, but story sharing is a great resource to use in your parish. It's an easy way to start conversations, non-threatening, and you can build up. One of our parishes uh, did this during Lent last year, and it proved to have great conversations um, throughout the Lenten season for those parishioners. And they were able to go deeper and deeper, sharing their faith stories and hearing other people's sacred stories. There are diocesan resources on our website for you, um, and all those are listed here. Um, there are also places in our diocese, as we learned um, through our history um, last week, that there are some sacred sites here within our diocese. And I've highlighted a few on our Black and Appalachia pilgrimage that both the youth and adults took. We went to the Appalachian African American Cultural Center, which is in Pennington Gap. And I learned things that I had no idea about um, in that area. And it was so informative and transformative. Um, right here in Amherst County in our diocese is the Monacan Indian Nation Museum. Um, I highly recommend that. Groups can go. Um, individuals can go. It's right situated right next to St. Paul's Bear Mountain. In Roanoke is the Harrison Museum of African American Culture. Um, there's the Legacy Museum of African American Culture in Lynchburg and the Ann Spencer House and Garden Museum here in Lynchburg. Ann Spencer was a marvelous poet, um, and I have learned so much. She has relatives that are still in the area, and if you want to learn more about Ann Spencer, um, I encourage you to talk to the Reverend Nina Salmon. Um, I'm not sure Nina's on tonight. She usually teaches on Tuesday night, um, but she has done a lot of work. Um, to learn more about Ann Spencer and her poetry, share that with her students at the University of Lynchburg. There are also archives available to all of us at Virginia Tech. Um, some of our diocesan archives are, are there as well, and it's a good place to do some research. Um, there are three other places that I want to highlight. I was talking with some of our guiding team members, and I like a road trip. Um, I used to live in Washington, D.C., and I highly encourage you, if you haven't been to these museums, to go um, to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, it's, it's a very moving experience. 
And I would say a lot, at least a couple of hours. Um, it will depend on you and your experience as you walk through that museum and what your feelings are as you go through there and, and learn, as we've talked about some in, in talking about sacred ground, some of that history that none of us were taught yet is so important to be aware of. We also find in Washington, the National Museum of the American Indian and the Washington National Cathedral, which has a lot of history of its own as well. Um, and so to take a look, take a road trip um, and, and see um, the history that's at the National Cathedral as well. Um, and so I encourage you, maybe it's take a weekend. Um, as some of us on the guiding team were talking, um, perhaps the diocese at some point will sponsor a trip to Washington. Maybe it's your convocation or your parish, rent a bus and take a group of people to walk together in this part of the journey. I put, uh, we could list books and go on forever uh, about books. Um, and so here and what you'll receive tomorrow are a couple of book lists. One is from church publishing. I also included children's resources for becoming beloved community, a, a list from a colleague of mine in the Diocese of East Tennessee that she compiled. And it's important, again, as I said at the outset, to remember that the mission and ministry of, beloved, of becoming beloved community is for all ages. It's important that we start with our children um, and that we're all on that journey together. It's important we think about the resources that we're sharing with our children. Are they inclusive? Do they show diversity? We also have a, a book resource list on our diocesan webpage for you all to utilize. There are two other books that I wanted to highlight. Um, as my friends on here will tell you, I am not musical. I can't carry a tune in a bucket, but to me, music is very moving. And there are two other hymnals. Um, the last parish I served in, which was in Washington, D.C., had all three, our 1982 hymnal, but these two hymnals as well, Lift Every Voice and Sing Two and Wonder, Love, and Praise. And I highly recommend those to you. Um, the music in there is, is wonderful. And to use these throughout the year, um, not just at one point or not just to use Lift Every Voice and Sing during Black History Month, um, but to use them throughout the year and their wonderful richness of music that they have. There are some other podcasts and videos that I've listed out here, um, The Way of Love has a tremendous number of videos and podcasts available on the Episcopal Church website. Um, there is another called the Beloved Community podcast. Um, there's also a video on Indigenous ministries from the National Episcopal Church and one for um, clergy or those who preach and teach um, is Prophetic Voices. It's a podcast I found preaching and teaching Beloved Community. Um, and I, I recommend that to you as well. We're going to have time towards the end for you all to share resources um, and our guiding team will as well. I encourage you if you'd like to use the chat function to put a resource in there that you have found special or meaningful, helpful in your continuing journey to becoming beloved community as well. Something that came across my desk a week or two ago is a um, program. It's a day program on a Saturday, April 13th, sponsored by the Episcopal Divinity School, Spirituality for Social Justice. In the email tomorrow, our follow-up email, I'll have the link to this, um, but it sounds like a wonderful event as you can read here. Um, witness uh, practices, wisdom, sounds, movements, that sustain us in our work for social justice. Um, there'll be lectures, group discussions, music and liturgy. It's an online program that you can join. And I hope some of you all will consider that. 
One of the other things that I found, and, and I, I showed one uh, last week, or uh, sorry, on week one, as we talked about Absalom Jones, was from the Diocese of Atlanta, produced uh, a Black, Episcopal Black History 365, highlighting Black Episcopalians, past and present, lay and clergy, male and female, gay and straight, who have helped walk with us in the ministry to becoming beloved community. Tonight, I'm gonna to show a, another one of these clips. They're short. You can find them on Facebook. They're not available on YouTube, um, but I found one that I'd like to share with you all about the life and prophetic voice of Polly Murray. Pauli Murray. I was born Anna Pauline Murray on November 20th, 1910. I was a civil rights activist and a lawyer. In 1950, I wrote a book entitled State's Laws on Race and Color, which Thurgood Marshall called the Bible of the Civil Rights Movements. From 1961 to 1963, I served on the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. In 1966, I co-founded the National Organization of Women for Women. I was a professor and administrator, holding posts at the Ghana School of Law, Benedict College, and Brandeis University. Throughout my adult life, I struggled with issues of sexual and gender identity. Many of my biographers have retroactively classified me as transgender. Drawn to ministry, I was ordained deacon in 1976. And in 1977, I was the first African-American woman to be ordained an Episcopal priest. I was a poet and prophet, a trailblazer and trendsetter. I died on July 1st, 1985 from pancreatic cancer. I am a saint in the Episcopal church and my feast day is July 1st. I am Polly Murray. If you're not familiar with the life and legacy of Polly Murray, I encourage you to learn more about it. One of those ways you can learn more about that and, and women who were marginalized in the Episcopal Church um, is through the documentary, The Philadelphia Eleven. It's recently been shown in Roanoke and this past Sunday in Lynchburg. Um, I attended the viewing on Sunday in Lynchburg and, and learned part of of the history that I did not know um, about these incredible women who spoke up and pursued and had allies that walked with them so that they could become clergy in our Episcopal Church. The next viewing is Sunday, April 7th in Blacksburg. There will also be a viewing in Stanton um, later in April, and they're working on that date and venue right now. Um, I can't recommend this enough. I, I want to see it again, um, to, to hear and continue to learn um, ab about these trailblazing women um, who made a path where there wasn't one. As we continue, I, I want to highlight a couple of events um, and, and days and um, encourage you to think about how you and how your parish might celebrate these days or be a part of these events. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Day in January, pride events and parades. Um, the diocese is sponsoring a booth uh, for the Roanoke Convocation to come together in April um, at a pride event there. Um, we have a pride flag for the diocese that has been passed around through events in Roanoke, Stanton, and Lynchburg. I also encourage you um, in June, the first weekend in June, to attend, if you're able, the Monica Nation Powwow. 
Um, it's a powerful coming together of many different nations. And I have been the past two years. What has been transformative and informative for me is at the beginning of the powwow, before they have what they call the parade of nations, marching and dancing in, is the master of ceremonies takes about 10 minutes to tell us, the visitors, how we can be gracious and respectful visitors, learning about the culture, learning about what will take place. And it's a powerful experience um, filled with joy, with dance, with music. Um, it's a great weekend if you are able. Many of our brothers and sisters from St. Paul's Bear Mountain participate and, and work at this event. Um, and it's it's certainly one not to be missed. Another event is Juneteenth and in October, Indigenous Peoples Day, formerly known as Columbus Day, are some things to think about. I, from the diocese, send out emails to all parishes um, on Dr. King Day, um, Juneteenth and Indigenous Peoples Day with prayers, um, with suggestions for services and resources to use for your parish. So if you're not seeing those, talk to your clergy, talk to the senior warden um, about how you can get those resources. One of the things that I've been so taken with is the work of Boyd Evans um, and his parish and his community in Abington with his speaker and speaker series. Um, we also have series from the diocese, and before Boy talks about his, um, one of the speakers that um, had a series maybe about five or six, seven years ago was Dr. Warney Reed, who is a retired professor now from Virginia Tech. His series is available on our diocesan website, and Brian, I'm going to invite you to speak to that for a moment, please. Sure. Um, as Patty said, uh, Dr. Warney Reed was a um, professor at Virginia Tech, and he did a series of lectures, um, uh, three lectures around the diocese, each are one hour long. And um, and of all the classes I've taken, of all the books that I've read, um, nothing has impacted me more than these three, three videos. Um, if you go to the diocesan website and click on Becoming Beloved Community, there'll be a few um, uh, videos down there and Dr. Reed's in a couple of those. Um, they're little five minute um, videos that you can check them out. But right below that, there's a link to the full length videos. And I highly encourage you to check out the full um, lectures from uh, Dr. Reed. They were so um, impactful on um, the ways that uh, racism has um, uh, made its way into our, 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 our systems and our, our culture. Um, things that I had no idea about. So again, there are three videos. They're about one hour long each, and you can um, really turn this into a learning opportunity. They're completely free. And so if you wanted to um, have a three-week class um, at your church and you could uh, maybe watch these videos and have some discussion afterwards on racism, um, I think that would be a, a wonderful thing. But I just wanted to really encourage you to check out these three videos from, from Dr. Warney Reed. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, Boyd, I uh, saw you earlier, and I'm going to invite you now to talk about your speaker series that you have um, and help to organize in Abingdon. Yeah, um, I had, um, I've always been a great admirer of Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, had been in contexts where uh, we had speakers. And when I came to Abingdon, there was a uh, there was and continues to be a, a really robust celebration of, of Dr. King's legacy here in Abingdon. But I don't know if it was for selfish reasons or, or whatever. The, you know, the first thing I did was I got involved with the, the group that plans the events. And I said, uh, you know, what if we had a speaker at St. Thomas as part of this celebration? And, and um, with their involvement, we started the speaker series. The actual first person we had was uh, Katrina Brown, which was really cool because she came and showed traces of the trade. But at that time, she was still working on sacred ground, but almost had it finished. And so we 
she talked about traces of the trade. We watched traces of the trade, and then she plugged sacred ground, and she sort of had us in her grasp. <laughs> so um, my phone didn't stop ringing after after her time uh, of her, of her talk in Abingdon with people saying, "When are we going to do sacred ground? When are we, when are we going to do that?" So um, I bugged her, and and we got sacred ground going pretty on. Uh, pretty early, but um, I think you know a, a lot of my early motivation was to get some of my heroes like Katrina Brown and others to uh, to speak. But it seemed like um, the talks that have gone best um, in our context have have been possibly from just some local people uh, like uh, Dr. Jerry Jones, whose whose picture is up on the slide now. And just talking about what it was like for him uh, to grow up in this region, experience uh, uh, segregation, segregation, and then experience desegregation, desegregation, and uh, his some of his remarks were just terribly eye-opening. Uh, in that, when when the schools were desegregated, uh, none of his uh, black peers and role models that he'd had for coaches or teachers or anything uh, were moved to the white school. So he, he says, we weren't desegregated, we were assimilated and, and shared some about how, how hard that was, was to transition to, to not having any role models that look like him. And it's, um, you know, the whole series has been, has been fantastic. It's been well received. It's really brought the broader community into our church and fostered some really good dialogue. And, you know, fr from there, we, we also did Sacred Ground, um, sort of leveraging off of this. But it was interesting that we had um, a large group of people from our community uh, because of the speaker series did Sacred Ground. It wasn't just people in the church. So it was really, really a great outreach. Thank you so much, Boyd. The second slide highlights some others that you have had. And, and I think there are a couple of great learnings there, as we heard before. Um, it doesn't have to be just at your church. This can be ecumenical efforts, community efforts, um, and inclusive of bringing people in for whatever program, whether it's Sacred Ground or another program that you might be offering um, that people want to be a part of because they want to connect with this important mission and ministry that we're all a part of and need to continue to walk in. Dr. Turner was very fascinating as well. If you haven't read his book, Harlan Renaissance, I would highly recommend that because I was had no idea of the large Black communities and the coal fields of this region prior to uh, reading that book. And it's sort of hidden history um, that he, he uncovers and shares there too. That's great. And I, I think it's a great reminder too that there are people right in our communities that have stories to tell um, and to invite those folks in to make sure that we're hearing those sacred stories. We're going to stop here. I'm going to stop the screen share before we finish and invite you all, um, if you'd like to unmute or use the chat, if there are resources that you would like to share, if you have questions about what has been shared, um, and, and just have a few minutes for open discussion and questions. Don't be shy. Um, I will tell you a, a book that I just found, um, and I, I can't remember if I mentioned it last week or not, um, but I am part of a, a group that meets every other week, and we begin with prayer, and the book that we've been using for our prayers is, and I'll put this in the um, email tomorrow, it's entitled Black Liturgies. Prayers, Poems, and Medi Meditations for Staying Human by Cole Arthur Riley. And it's, it has a section on Lent, and it's it's been very helpful. Kathy Maddox, I see your hand raised. Feel free to unmute and chime in. 
Um, I just found out that um, they're going to do an online showing of the Philadelphia 11 this Friday. Um, I'm trying to pull it up. Um, it's at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I was going to put the link on it. It's $10. And all proceeds um, benefit the film's distribution. Thank you, Kathy. That's great. Um, and if you want to shoot that to me, um, I will put that in the follow-up email as okay. well. Okay. Please check the resources. Nina Salmon has um, just put some resources in there, a list from Building Faith, um, Black History Month resources. And I'm copying that. I will include that in the list of resources tomorrow as well um, as I just do that and Tuck has put in the the chat he would encourage people to explore the resources in seeing the face of God in each other um, the one-time anti-racism training curriculum from the Episcopal Church there are many anti-racism training curriculums available and so um, I've done several classes and always learned something from each one. Boyd. If if one if one wanted to show the Philadelphia 11 movie in their convocation or in their parish, how would one go about that? Do you know? Um, you, you can reach uh, Nina. <laughs> You're muted. Yeah. Ah, so good. Um, there is a $500 screening fee for that. And uh, I think that's right. So you have to just reach out to the organizers and pay the fee. So that's what the Lynchburg Convocation did. They, they pulled resources. Um, there is some diocesan money. So if a convocation or a parish is not able to do that, um, please reach out to me. And, and I will see if I can help you out as well. Um, and Stephanie, who was on our Black and Appalachia pilgrimage, um, we're hoping that we can do one. Um, Preston did two in a row. He did the pilgrimage two years ago with the youth and then last spring with adults. Um, he asked to, to take a, a year off, but I'm hoping that we can. So thank you for asking that. I'm glad you were on that pilgrimage. Um, as, as you can share as well, it, it was a very moving experience and um, glad that you were part of it and, and hope others will take advantage of that as well in the future. Um, Tuck has put some other resources in the chat and I will um, include those. And any other questions? Uh, resources to share anything that you all have before we close out. All right, let me go back to our slides and I'm gonna go back to screen sharing and let's see. Patty, while you're doing that, I have one more thing. All of our general convention deputies, um, Boyd is one, um, have or will be taking the Absalom Jones Center training, uh, anti-racism training. Um, and it's $50, anybody can sign up for it. They have made um, really good efforts to make an online training available. Um, seeing the face of God, um, as Tuck said, has been the standard in the Episcopal Church. Um, it's an in-person module and it's it's uh, two days and it's really robust and has some really good things to commend it. Um, I did talk to Catherine Meeks about the Seeing the Face of God curriculum and she um, had some really good insights about what was really good about that curriculum and what she tried to do to create the um, module for Absalom Jones Center. and. The apps, I've done, a, I think, five or six trainings, and I'm trained as a trainer in three um, different modules. And um, the Absalom Jones Center is as good as, as any of the ones that I've done. It's short. It is a Zoom, um, and they keep it, they limit it to a certain size. So if anyone is interested in doing or needs to do for your parish, 
um, uh, an anti-racism training, I would, I would recommend the Absalom Jones Center. It's $50, easy to sign up, easy to complete. It's an eight hour training through Zoom. And Tuck, I will put that registration link in the email tomorrow, um, both just to the Absalom Jones Center, but the registration as well. There's also through the Absalom Jones Center, um, anti-racism training for youth, our canon for evangelism and youth ministry, Jenny Ferris, has been trained in that um, and, and can lead that for youth as well. Again, a reminder that we are all on this journey, children, youth, and adults of all ages, um, working and journeying towards becoming beloved community. And so, um, oh, and Catherine has been trained as well. Catherine Doyle, the Reverend Catherine Doyle at Boys Home and Emmanuel Covington and in Hot Springs. Thank you. Um, so there are several trainers that can, can work and walk with our youth um, in that important ministry. Um, so now as we come to the end of our hour, um, I'm going to invite Brian to pray us out using the prayer for jo social justice from our Book of Common Prayer. Thank you, Patty. Let us pray. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. I want to encourage you all to, to come back next week. Uh, we have the Reverend Marisa Safantes with us, who is at St. John's in Roanoke, um, and we'll be returning via Zoom to lead a workshop taking us past sacred ground and what we can do next, um, how to take action both in our parishes, in our own lives, and in our communities. It will be an hour and a half next week. Um, just a reminder about that, but um, I highly encourage that and for you to encourage others in your parish to join us next week. Until then, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. God bless. <laughs>